Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's great to have you all here. And thank you to Brendan and the team for inviting me to be your speaker tonight. Um, could I note, there are many distinguished and senior leaders here in the room, and I welcome your interest in both General Monash and the Battle of Hamel. More generally though, I welcome a public interest in a man who is a significant foundation figure in the story of the Australian Army and the Australian Defence Force, and a significant figure whose influence is so vastly beyond that of simply being a general, an army officer, uh, a, a member of the military. We'll get to that. <clears throat> and Chris, thank you for your kind uh, uh, thoughts and introduction. Might I make uh, my introductory remarks simply by uh, acknowledging our many distinguished guests and also to recognise and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay our collective respects to their elders, both past and present. It's really important uh, to do that, not generally in Australia, but particularly for an army officer to do that. We are of the land. And that connection of land between an army and its nation and our Indigenous peoples and our nation is so profound, I think it's something that I have stressed all through the period when I was the Chief of the Army to say, I want our Indigenous peoples to be part of our continuing story. And they are, and they are brilliant soldiers, as many, many others are also. And I welcome them and I pay my respects to them. So, of Monash and the Battle of Hamel. The Battalion War Diary of the Fighting 13th Battalion of the 4th Brigade, the 1st Australian Imperial Force, records that at midnight on the night of the 3rd, 4th July, 1918, it moved onto marking tapes designating the line of departure for an attack south of the River Somme. The battalion was to be part of the centre-right forward assault element. Their objective was a line just past the Vare Wood. The attack became known as the Battle of Hamel. The 13th was under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Marks, DSO, MC, MID, sometimes referred to as the Boy Colonel. Marks had been promoted to command the battalion in November 1917. He was 22 years old and already a veteran combat leader of Australian infantry from the Gallipoli campaign, including the landing at Anzac and many battles on the Western Front. In March of 1918, he had led the 4th Brigade advance to halt the German breakthrough at Hubertain, securing that town. This is during the German Spring Offensive. The brigade commander subsequently messaged, and I quote, the Corps commander is afraid to let the defence of Hubertan out of your hands. Such was his commanding presence. The 13th War Diary records what occurred at zero hour, 3.10am, on the morning of the 4th of July, 1918. It says, barrage opened with a crash, tanks just passing battalion headquarters. Immediately, the barrage came down, the battalion moved forward, crawling to within 60 yards of the barrage, which was well-timed and fairly accurate. The tanks were not heard during the preliminary eight minutes bombardment, and no suspicion was aroused in the minds of the enemy in our sector. Then, at 3.14 a.m., it states, tanks caught the infantry at the first lift, and enemy's first line of post was met on a road running north. A small post had been met about 100 yards out from our tapes, but neither this post nor the one on the road gave any trouble. By 3.45 a.m., Marx reported all assault companies were clear of the woods that had been their initial objective and were shaking out 
under an artillery halt. At 4.18 a.m., the war diary notes A Company was on its final objective and in touch with the 15th Battalion on their left. Final consolidation of the battalion's objectives occurred at 6 a.m. with linking up to the 15th Battalion on the left and the 21st Battalion on the right. The battalion's mission was achieved at a cost to the battalion of only 26 killed, 99 wounded and one missing. Across the battlefront, other battalions had similar success, notwithstanding fierce fighting in the vicinity of Pear and Ver trenches. By the standard of the day and that time of the war, the battle was a resounding success. Much has since been written about the Battle of Hamel. A remarkable amount when we consider the action was for a mere 93 minutes in a four year long war fought for us by the Australian Imperial Force within the British Expeditionary Force and its allies on the Western Front. This evening I'd like to reflect upon Hamel and the leadership offered by Lieutenant General Manash. Key to doing so is context, a preoccupation both of historians and generals alike. John Monash was promoted to Lieutenant General and given command of the Australian Corps of about 150,000 troops on the 31st of May, 1918. He was the second Australian to achieve the distinction of Corps Command during the war, the other being Sir Harry Chevelle in the Palestine campaign. Monash was the first, uh, Monash conceived first the Battle of Hamel as a divisional commander. But when he became the, the corps commander, it was the first fight that he conceived to lead as a corps commander. The recent history of the first AF makes this assessment. There was much in the planning and execution of the attack that was innovative and adaptive, but it was the bringing together of a number of widely sourced ideas and the management of the planning process that has given Hamel and its chief planner, Monash, such a positive reputation. The battle planned by Monash was a limited objective attack. The aim was to remove a small salient immediately south of the Somme River, essentially straightening the line. The importance of this is that the Germans had been firing from the salient directly into the Australian flank on the north bank of the Somme. Monash had conceived the operation months earlier, as I said, when he was commanding the 3rd Division. But now, as the Corps Commander, he had the chance to plan and execute it. In one of his first actions as Commander, Monash sought approval for the attack from the 4th Army Commander, his boss, General Rawlinson. Rawlinson supported Monash's idea, although he had reservations, noting the five divisions of the Australian Corps were in combination approximately 8,300 men below strength. Rawlinson wrote to Haig, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Expeditionary Force on the 25th of June, noting, after going into General Monash's proposals, I'm of the opinion that if the operation is successful, the casualties should not be great, as it is intended to make the operation essentially a surprise tank attack. I consider the advantages gained will be well worth the cost. General Haig concurred with Rawlinson, but directed that units of what he termed the unblooded American Expeditionary Force participate in the battle. And they were most welcome. Down at battalion level, Douglas Marks recorded in the 13th Battalion's diary. He says, a very welcome addition to my strength in the shape of seven officers and 237 other ranks of A Company, 132nd Regiment, United States Army, arrived late on the night of the 29th June. After setting aside one officer and 20 other ranks to remain with the nucleus, the four platoons were attached, one to each company of the battalion. And this was occurring across the battlefront. Now, only last week I had the honour and opportunity to travel to Washington DC where there was an acknowledgement of 100 years of mateship commemorating 
that bonding of our forces at the Battle of Hamel. Hamel refined a model of combined arms, the bringing together of infantry, armour, artillery, engineers, aviation, etc. It, it refined a model of combined arms operations which was first attempted with limited success at Cambrai in November 1917. Hamel was to prove the concept and the technologies in, involved. The objectives were achieved by adapting and synchronising the new forms of warfare, tanks, aircraft, massed indirect fire of artillery and machine guns, and gas. Now I point out, while the modern construct of the employment of technology in the First World War featured all of these as a necessary design, and we read our histories of the First World War understanding that, the atrocious uh, horrors of gas warfare understood then by all participants are uh, well understood now and are uh, an, uh, an utterly illegal and ab abhorrent uh, use uh, against humans. But these synchronisation of arms was what Monash was trying to achieve. At the same time, working on operational security and deception to ensure Monash's plan was not understood by his enemy and counted before it even began. To do that, troop and artillery movements only happened at night and all traces of movement were removed before daylight. For over a week before the battle, the Australians shelled the enemy for exactly eight minutes at the same time each night using a combination of high explosive rounds, smoke and gas in combination to condition and make them expect that tomorrow night and the night after and the night after there'll be another barrage of eight minutes at exactly the same time. On the morning of the battle, the gas was emitted from the barrage. This greatly facilitates mobility and awareness. But Germans were captured wearing gas masks, restricting their vision and their movement. North of the Somme, a faint attack at Ville occurred also on the 4th of July, further to confuse the enemy. So Hamel was fought by the 4th Australian Division under Major General Ewan Sinclair McGlagan, one of only five British officers to serve in the AAF for the duration of the war. He had joined the AAF from an instructional position at Duntroon in 1914. And in memory of Sinclair McLagan, uh, the chief of our Navy uh, now uh, lives in Sinclair McLagan House. In addition to the elements of the 4th Division and US elements of the 33rd Division, the order of battle also included elements of the 2nd, 3rd and in the majority of the 4th Divisions. This was designed to spread casualties across different formations so as not to critically weaken any single division of the Australian Corps. Interestingly, only bat 10 battalions would be used in the assault. Now, Peter Pedersen, a, an Australian military historian, in his work Monash as Military Commander, he offers us a startling comparison. So 10 battalions would assault in the Battle of Hamel each on a, front, on a frontage which German General Ludendorff had allocated to an entire division in the 21st March 1918 Spring Offensive, the failed last attempt by the Germans to break the Western Line. Monash's idea was that artillery, tanks and other technological aids would make up for the reduced use and employment of people. To do this, we see Hamel as the first battle that used the new Mark V tank. It was faster, more powerful, and more reliable than the Mark IV. At a scintillating three miles per hour, it offered a 50% increase in speed over the Mark IV's two miles per hour. Importantly though, a critical improvement in the Mark V. It only needed one driver. 
rather than the four required to coordinate and drive the Mark IV. A previous Australian operation with tanks, Bullock Corps, in April of 1917, hadn't gone so well. It had been something of a disaster with regard to the employment of tanks. Monash ensured the Australian infantry trained with the new tanks to build familiarity and overcome any lingering distrust of the technology. And this was revolutionary technology of the day. Again, the 13th Battalion War Diary records. On the 28th, 29th and 30th June, parties in aggregate 180 officers and other ranks were taken to take part in a demonstration exercise with tanks. It continues. On the 30th of June, the officers of the Tank Corps detailed to work with the battalion visited our lines to become perfectly familiar with the officers with whom they would be working. Monash's insistence on training and rehearsals meant Hamel would prove to the Australians that tanks could work well with the infantry. And this kind of combined arms integration, rehearsal, preparation and employment is something I and every army officer here inherently understands as our core business. But it wasn't then. In those days, for the infantry to rise above the trench lines at the end of the artillery barrage and storm in human wave was all too familiar. Now, despite success in many aspects, the battle wasn't all smooth. Some artillery fired short, causing friendly casualties. In the centre of the assault, tanks didn't arrive in time to assist the attack at Pear Trench. The concept of the combined arms broke down. The infantry adapted and overcame enemy as they have always done so, using fire, movement and bravery. The 15th Battalion's Henry Dalziel was awarded the 1000th Victoria Cross for his valour during the fight for Pear Trench. When the 15th met strong resistance from heavily armed enemy in the trench, Henry silenced machine gun fire as the second member of a Lewis gun team. When fire opened up from another post, he dashed forward with his revolver and killed or captured the crew and gun, allowing the advance to continue. The tip of his trigger finger was shot away and he was ordered to the rear. Instead, he continued to serve his Lewis gun in the final storming of the trench. After again being ordered back to the aid post, he began taking ammunition up to the front line until he was shot in the head and severely wounded. There was something in the air at Hamel in that brief 93 minutes, a surfeit of valour for sure. Adjacent and to the right of Pear Trench, the 16th Battalion was assaulting Vare Trench. Lance Corporal Thomas Jack Axford was awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions. His citation describes that on the 4th of July, 1918, during the attack at Vair and Hamel Woods, France, when the advance of the adjoining platoon was being delayed in uncut wire and machine gun fire, and his company commander had become a casualty, Lance Corporal Axford charged and threw bombs amongst the enemy gun crews. He then jumped into the trench and charging with his bayonet, killed 10 of the enemy and took six prisoners. He threw the machine guns over the parapet indicating to the, de the delayed platoon they were able to advance. He then rejoined his own platoon and fought with it during the remainder of the operations. Recognition of valour wasn't confined to Australians. The first United States Army Medal of Honour in World War I was awarded to Corporal Thomas Pope of the US 131st Infantry Regiment, Illinois National Guard, for his actions during the battle. The British Expeditionary Force also awarded four DSOs, four military crosses and six military medals to members of the US forces participating in the battle. There were many innovations that assisted the attack. Some interesting examples. Carrier tanks were used to resupply the assaulting troops on their objectives. Each tank dropped 12,500 rounds of ammunition and defence stores to the troops on the objective. 
Pedersen notes quite rightly, at least one infantry commander thought that in this achievement, which represented the loads normally carried by 1,250 men, lay the outstanding lesson of the battle. Too many advances, too many local ca tactical gains during this war were lost through counterattack. And this was a brilliant way to give our troops at the front every opportunity to consolidate their gains. In a similar vein, aircraft of the Royal Flying Corps were used to conduct aerial resupply of ammunition to the forward troops. But in this case, I'll quote, reports on the dropping of 112,000 rounds of ammunition by aircraft were favourable, but not enthusiastic, for many parachutes failed to open. And a box of ammunition without a parachute above it is a very dangerous thing indeed. <coughs> now, Monash had forecast, as we've heard, the battle would take 90 minutes to achieve its objectives based on lifts of the field artillery barrage, speed of the tanks, and the firepower of the advancing infantry. The objectives were achieved in 93 minutes, whereupon digging in and reinforcement operations began to repel expected counterattacks. During the attack, the Allied forces suffered 1,400 casualties, took 1,600 prisoners, and captured 177 machine guns. Now, that is 177 machine guns firing every bullet at every opportunity to kill our troops. It is an extraordinarily lethal environment in which these people were operating. Reflecting on the battle eight years after the war, Monash stated, no battle within my previous experience, not even Messines, passes off so smoothly, so exactly to timetable, always free from any kind of hitch. Monash was rightly and has rightly received recognition for the success of Hamill. Although it is clear Sinclair McLagan's cool professionalism in command of the 4th Division was also vitally important. And Monash acknowledged this. He said McLagan's tact, industry and judgment in controlling the mission were superb. He later wrote of McLagan, in appearance and temperament, he is every inch a soldier. Although not Australian born, he was wholeheartedly Australian. And this is high praise indeed at that time. Monash's plan embraced technical innovation. He grasped that it could have a real effect on restoring mobility to the battlefield, mobility lost for nearly four years in defensive trench warfare. Although by 1918 standards, Hamel was a small operation, the lessons of the battle were circulated to all commanders of the British Expeditionary Force. The gathering of lessons began at the lowest of levels. Appendices to the 13th Battalion's War Diary deal with lessons about Lewis guns, enemy machine guns, artillery barrages, tanks, ammunition, stores, and even mules. While individual aspects of the plan, such as the use of tanks, had been used before, Monash's achievement was to bring them all together at once. Pedersen again highlights this. What is certain is that once it was suggested, Monash's enthusiasm for the use of tanks far exceeded that of both his army commander above him and his divisional commanders below him. Now, the Battle of Amiens, one month later, was the immediate legacy of what was learnt from Hamel. On the 8th of August, three corps of British, Australian and Canadian infantry supported by a cavalry division, 2,070 guns and 432 tanks, 800 aircraft, launched an attack that by nightfall had punched an 11 kilometre salient into the German lines. Hamel, albeit on a far smaller scale, had been the final test bed of many of the techniques used at Amiens. Amiens was the greatest success in a single day on the Western Front and the largest single battle in which the AIF fought. General Erich Ludendorff, the German commander, described it and famously described it as the black day of the German army in this war. So Hamel is a, as a battle is a great case study. But when you step back and look at it in a wider context, a deeper, richer and more interesting story appears. 
Despite the extraordinary claims and perhaps some breathlessness amongst authors, Hamill wasn't really the first of anything. It was, however, the culmination of many things and the precursor of things to come. As I've said, every army officer in this room understands how to fight the Battle of Hamel, but we don't understand human wave tactics, which came before. A large part of Hamel's significance is its symbolism of the Australian Imperial Forces' evolution since those early days at Gallipoli. At Gallipoli, Australian troops were brave, but still largely raw and inexperienced. This is reflected in the command uncertainty after the landing and the inability to achieve objectives in the early days. Monash's own papers held here at the War Memorial reflect the confusion and disarray of his 4th Brigade in those early days and early weeks after they went ashore on the 27th of April. Yet by July 1918, the Australians were able to devise, command and execute a division-sized operation conducted with multinational troops and were fighting as a corps a month later. Significantly, Hamill employed that combined arms approach both at the doctrinal level in its training and its conceptualisation amongst its people, as well as at the technological level to capture and hold that limited objective we've spoken of. Now, the idea that we were learning in this war is evidenced by Monash's comments. He was quite well aware of this. And he said, quote, now, we Australian commanders were in our fifth year of intensive training as war leaders, graduating laboriously from stage to stage, beginning with the command of a battalion of about 1,000 men, or in the case of a squadron, 200 men, and ending as commanders of divisions of 20,000 men or a full army corps. Not only had we seen the machine and all the parts of it at work from below as well as from above, but we had witnessed the gradual expansion and improvement of the machine from day to day and had grown with it in experience and aptitude. Monash further noted, by that time, 1918, everyone had naturally gained some years' experience in the technology of tactics of weapons and munitions and of the many and varied problems of the maintenance of armies in the field. The change in the AIF from 1914 to 1918 was profound. The change was broader than just its commanders. Notwithstanding the heavy casualties experienced across the infantry divisions of the AIF, a cadre, typified by the likes of Marx and Dalziel, had been almost continually engaged in modern conflict since Gallipoli. There was depth of experience and learning evident at all levels of the Australian Corps. The Corps was by then the equal of any other formation in the British Expeditionary Force, successfully for fighting a sophisticated enemy in the main theatre of the war. This is a remarkable achievement if we consider the state of the Australian Army and Australian military capability generally as it was in 1913, when the army of the day was a group of militias, largely the residual effects of colonial experience, numbering only 20,000. Hamel established precedents that have been true for the Australian army ever since. As Roger Lee notes, the AIF did not fight in isolation and its development as a fighting force owed a great deal to developments within the wider British Expeditionary Force and indeed beyond to all those fighting in the First War. The Australian Corps fighting, learning and developing in partnership within coalition forces echoes through to today. It's what we do today. We see it in our approach to training, development operations with our Five Eyes and regional partners. The battle was the first time Australians operated closely with our American allies, but not the last. And we've served alongside the Americans in every major conflict since. A significant feature of Hamel, innovation and the adaptation and application of technology endures in the Army today as it mo does more broadly in the Defence Force. The use of innovation and technology is often key to tactical victory. 
It is equally important in its use to help Australian soldiers, sailors, airmen and women survive and return home safely. Our nation values dearly the lives of its volunteer citizen soldiers. In return for their service, they do deserve the best technology available to give them the protection, mobility and lethality to do what we ask of them. They deserved it then and truly they deserve it today. My final point regarding training and professionalism is about Monash's fastidious adherence to training and development as a lifelong pursuit. His efforts in 1916 and early 1917 training the third division in England and his well-documented and demonstrated personal commitment to education and training are testament to this. The rigorous training and rehearsals he insisted upon prior to Hamel contributed to its success. This is a lesson taken to heart by the Australian Army. If I were to be in 1918 and attending Monash's final rehearsals with hundreds of leaders at every level around a major mud model of the Hamel front, I would be completely comfortable in that environment as it is completely normal in the environment in which our soldiers operate today. And this is an extraordinary legacy, not just of Monash, but he was a principal architect of this kind of professionalisation of our force. The Australian success at Hamel in 1918 was due to leadership exercised through meticulous planning, attention to detail, professionalism, thorough training and preparation, and a clear idea of the objective. Every component of the attacking force knew their role and performed it to the best of their ability. It is a textbook case study of how to plan a deliberate attack, and it remains relevant today. But I contend this isn't necessarily why we remember it, or not only why we remember it. Nor is it a nationalistic or jingoistic celebration of an Australian victory. There were other victories in the Great War and many since, equally worthy of attention. So why Hamill? Hamill, to me, is ultimately a great story of our people and their service as individuals and as an extraordinary team, moulded and driven by an extraordinary leader. Hamill reinforces the, the, the truism that an army is made of its people. A democratic nation's army is as good as the support of its citizens, its government and its coalition partners working as a single team. In this respect, Australia was and is the lucky country. Monash as corps commander was the right man at the right time. His intellect drive and dare I say ambition combined with decades of professional development and four years wartime command experience delivering a smart victory. And there were too few of them in that war. Yet Monash alone could achieve nothing. He was reliant on an organisation of 150,000 Australians in order to achieve that goal. And many others from the BEF and the US forces who were part of the integrated whole. This is a story of otherwise ordinary Australians. People such as Marx, Dalziel and Axford doing extraordinary things in incredibly trying circumstances. It's about Australians accepting responsibility, quietly and humbly going about their duty, but determined to do that duty well. Monash, Marx, Dalziel and Axford personify the Australian Imperial Forces' rapid professionalisation and growth in capability over four years of combat operations. And to me, this is ultimately what I remember and what I'm deeply proud of. Sir John Monash continued his distinguished career in service to our nation after the war. The statue in front of this place, unveiled and dedicated this morning, is the latest of many deserving acknowledgements of his contribution to Australia, to us all. But what of the other Hamill protagonists I've mentioned this evening? They too returned home and went on living in service to Australia, albeit in generally quieter circumstances. Henry Dalziel recovered from his severe head injury in England, returning home to Queensland in January 1919. Travelling home by train, he received a hero's welcome 
at every station on the way back to the Atherton Tableland. He became a farmer, a factory worker, and a soldier in the citizen military forces. Later, he developed an interest in songwriting. Henry Dalziel died of a stroke in the repatriation hospital in Brisbane at the age of 72, a life well lived. Thomas Axford came home to Australia in December of 1918, just on furlough. The war, though, ended, and discharged he was in February of 1919. He recommenced work as a labourer. In Perth, in November of 1926, he married Lily Foster, a shop assistant. They lived in Mount Hawthorne and had five children. He became a clerk. On the 25th of June, 1941, he was mobilised into the militia, rising to the rank of sergeant, but discharged uh, on the 14th of April, 1947, had it, having again done his duty for his nation. In his leisure time, Jack regularly attended the races. He was returning from a reunion of the Victoria Cross and George Cross Association when he died on an aircraft between Dubai and Hong Kong in October of 1983. Dalziel's and Axford's Victoria Crosses are on display here in the Hall of Valour. Douglas Marks returned to Australia, leaving the Australian Imperial Force in February of 1919 also. He was accepted into law at the University of Sydney. He deferred for a year in order to study Latin and took a managerial job with a paper bag manufacturer. A biographer tells what happened before he commenced his law studies. In a heavy surf at Palm Beach on the 25th of January, 1920, Marx, an indifferent, an indifferent swimmer, was drowned in an unsuccessful attempt to rescue a drowning stranger. His body was never recovered. An overflowing congregation, made up mainly of ex-members of his battalion, attended a memorial service at St James Church in Sydney. Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Marks, Distinguished Service Order, Military Cross, four mentions in dispatches, was 24 when he drowned. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Murray, Victoria Cross, who had served and fought with Marx in the 13th Battalion, said, We love Douglas Marx for his high, indomitable spirit, his dash and his daring. No truer comrade ever lived. Hamill is a story of a battle, but its real story is that of the soldiers who fought, those who were killed and wounded, and those who came home and continued to serve our nation through their citizenship, and through their deliberate actions. Ultimately, Hamill is part of the rich 117 year history of the Australian soldier, innovative, determined, and professional, lest we forget. Thank you.